Welcome back to Know the Faith. We're here at the Catholic Rural Life Festival in the state of Maine. This event features educational presentations on bread making and herbs, art, cheese making, canning, lots of music, devotions, the blessing of the fields and the animals, and several opportunities to attend Holy Mass. We're sitting down with Max Becker, a board member of the Catholic Rural Life Organization and a musician with the group Hidden Fifth. Max, thanks for chatting with me. What can you tell us about the history of Catholic Rural Life? Yeah, sure. Uh, the, the organization was started in, in the 20s, uh, 1923, and it was started by uh, uh, Father Edwin O'Hara. And the organization was founded in response to what was perceived as a rural problem in the church. Um, it was apparent that uh, rural Catholics were not getting the same pastoral care that Catholics in the city were. And, and so that was the problem that was trying to be addressed. In the early days of CRL, um, the majority of the efforts were to give Catholics a, a good Catholic education if they lived in a rural area. So it was education focused. Um, in, in more recent years, there's been more policy advocacy. There's been a lot of work on, um, th there's been a lot of policy advocacy for family farmers. Um, and it's, you, as, as leadership and membership has changed over the years, the emphasis of Catholic rural life has changed. But what has remained constant is their commitment to serve rural Catholics um, in, in, the, in the face of what seems to be an underserving of Catholics that live in rural areas. I see. And what originally attracted you to this organization? Well, um, I am Catholic. I was uh, I was born and raised Catholic, and um, as a in my in my late high school and early college years, I took an interest in farming, and I actually wanted to do this as a career. And that interest in farming led me to study Catholic social teaching, which I was introduced to in college in a, in a one semester course. And I really took an interest in what the church had to say about about rural culture and rural life and farmers in particular. And I was surprised to find that she actually said quite a bit and um, actually stood up very much for the necessity of rural culture in society. So as I began to read more and more of, of these documents of Catholic social teaching, uh, my, my interest was peaked. I ended up writing my, you know, my, my thesis you know, on the topic of agriculture in Catholic social teaching. And in the research that I was doing, and in the conversations that I had in the wake of that research, uh, someone gave me a magazine for Catholic Rural Life and said, hey, I think you might be interested in this. And most of my research was done at that point, and I did not know that there was a Catholic organization devoted to rural issues. So I was, um, I, I was elated, I was really excited. So, some time passed before, before I subscribed myself, but I, I, I rediscovered them. A few years later, subscribed to the magazine, and um, uh, it's been history ever since. <laughs> you talked about uh, the church's teaching. Can you give us some examples about what popes or the church has said about Catholic social teaching, or more specifically about the agrarian life? Absolutely, yeah. Um, first of all, it, it's all rooted in the goodness of creation, that, that creation is is you know, if you look at, at the book of Genesis, God created the world and he saw that it was good. And then he created man and put him in the garden to till and to keep it. And that, that task was given to man before the fall. It was made harder after the fall, but that task was there even in the pre-fallen state. So that's, that's what all these teachings are rooted in. And in light of that, you have popes like Pope Pius XII, for example, in, in 1946, speaking to a federation of Italian farmers, and you know, I, I, I quote him directly, he said, Great care must be taken to preserve for the nation the essential elements of what might be called genuine rural culture. And that was back in 1946, and rural communities have taken a lot of hits since then. So yeah, I, I would say his words are all the more relevant now. And it's not like he's the only one. Yeah, uh, Pope Leo XIII, 
um, who some see as the father of the, you know, the modern Catholic social teaching movement, for lack of a better word. Rerum Navarum is often seen as, as the, the first in a series of many social encyclicals. And a strong theme in Rerum Navarum was that all, all wealth comes from the land and that you know, man is rooted in the land. And even if you go back earlier to Pius VII, uh, going back to the early 1800s, he had very strong words for affirming the dignity of the farmer and the vocation to farm. Um, yeah, I, could, I could go on and on. You know, there, there, there's hardly been a pope in the last hundred years that has not said something to affirm the dignity of the vocation to farm and the necessity of rural culture in the whole church. Right. Uh, we spoke privately uh, about something like this earlier. Maybe you could comment on it and see if you share my opinion. Now, in the culture, there seems to be a holiday or newly created secular festival for every day, whether it's National Taco Day or Donut Day or our Talk Like a Pirate Day or whatever it is. Uh, it just seems to me that our church has always had a cycle of feast. And as that faded away in the culture, you know, like ember days or rogation days, society seemed to want to replace it with what I sort of call the festivals of nonsense. Do you see that connection and our need for something like that? Uh, and that it doesn't really need to be recreated and that we've always really had access to these sort of cycles and in, in the seasons of the church? Absolutely, I see exactly what you're saying, and I think that's a really good point. Human beings function along cycles. You know, we, we wake and we sleep. We, um, every, everything we do in life comes in cycles and goes. And this is something that you see very clearly in a rural setting, uh, especially a farmer who has to interact very closely with nature. He sees the seasons come and go. He has to adapt to what they, uh, you know, what they bring to his crops and his life. And we can be a little bit isolated from that when we live in the city. So when you look at the church's liturgical life and the liturgical calendar, um, there are also cycles. There are seasons. You know, we move from one liturgical season to the next. To, to the next. We have periods of fasting and we have periods of feasting. And for one who is in tune with the cycles of nature, which is really just the way the world works and the way we were created, that liturgical cycle is going to make more sense. So that's looking at it one way. I feel like you were approaching it from the direction of man seems to realize that he has a need to celebrate things. He needs to, um, you know, pronounce certain things and set aside time to, uh, to appreciate them. And in a situation where you lack that liturgical cycle, I think you're going to create your own. <laughs> And that seems to be what people are doing. Right, yeah. Fortunately. <laughs> right, yeah. And how do you think this movement then could help the church, which seems to be struggling right now in our modern age, how we can look back to the tradition that has been handed down to us, and that might really help us uh, today in all that we have going on in the church? Well, I feel like the faith is essentially something that is lived. And when you stop living it, I think you do lose your identity. Um, if, if you stop going to Mass, being Catholic doesn't mean that much anymore. If you, if you stop celebrating the feasts, it doesn't mean that much anymore. Um, I think if you, you know, to the extent that you remove yourself from relating to God in what I like, I like to refer to as His original temple, and that is not my, uh, that's not my invented term, um, but I, I love the term God's original temple because that is where we first encounter God. So if you, are, if you are living that, if you are living the liturgical cycle, if you are living in tune with God in nature, in his original temple, I think you do recover a lot of that identity that is lost. Now, recently you wrote an article in, a, in an issue of the Catholic Rural Life magazine about folk music and how that was connected to farming or rural culture. Could you expand on that idea, on that connection between those two ideas of music and the rural culture and festivals and life? Yeah, so um, in addition to being farmers, my wife and I are also musicians. Uh, we play a lot of folk music, we play for a lot of contra dances. 
And so Catholic Rural Life approached me a few months ago and said, would you write an article about the, the relationship between your music and your farming? You know, in other words, are these related or is it random that you are a musician and a farmer? And I spend a lot of time thinking about it because my wife and I always got excited when we saw music and farming coming together in an event. It always made us really happy. They seemed to fit very well together. For example, a music festival on a farm um, in a, or music in a rural setting. They seemed to fit together. And so I wanted to, I wanted to ask the question, is this random? Are these just two, uh, two hobbies of ours that we happen to like, but that have no inherent connection to each other? And the more I thought about it, the more I saw a lot of connections between, uh, between music and farming, music and food. And um, I, I think what the connection comes down to essentially is that music and food are both rural products, uh, to use kind of a crude term. But when, when you look at what rural communities provide to society, the most obvious one is food, fuel, and fiber. And you know, that's what people think of as a farmer providing them. But if you look a little deeper, Folk music is a genuinely rural product. You know, folk music was uh, born on on country porches, around the fire, in the kitchen, you know, by good old folks coming together and and finding a way to spend time together and do something beautiful and meaningful. So, you know, going back to that quote by Pius the Twelfth, he says, "We have to preserve genuine rural culture." I think you can ask, what is genuine rural culture? It's got a lot of elements. I think music is an important one, and I think celebration of food is another one. And here's what's interesting. Try to think of a celebration without food and without music. And without either one, it kind of falls flat. <laughs> so Max, you're a board member and a representative for the National Catholic Rural Life Group. Are you aware of this type of movement or program outside of the United States? And uh, here, uh, there seems to be kind of a regional group. Are there little pockets or regional groups of Catholic rural life that people can connect with around the different parts of the United States? Uh, yes, I'm not sure about the international situation. Uh, I'm, I'm not aware of anything off the top of my head. But Catholic rural life as a national organization has what they consider chapters. And it, it's, it's fairly loosely organized, and it's more or less up to the chapters to, to choose what they're going to do. But uh, what we're doing here in Maine is this Catholic Rural Life Festival that's happening this weekend. This is the third one. Uh, I, I, was not, uh, I was not part of the first one, but um, it, it was very small. It was kind of a seminal event to, to get the idea going. And then last year was a a very successful festival where essentially the goal was to bring together people to have a conversation about the relationship between nature and grace and the role of rural culture and even the question what is rural culture uh, the, the popes say this matters why does it matter and how does this matter to us and how can we make it relevant and how can we live this as a parish you know these are all the sorts of questions we're coming together to have and over and above the conversation we're also coming together simply to celebrate like we were saying earlier, uh, this is this is essential for human beings to, to celebrate the good things, to appreciate creation, and to recognize the Creator in it. For our listeners who are interested in the Catholic Rural Life Movement, where can they go to get more information and even sign up for membership if that's something that they feel interested in? I would send them to the Catholic Rural Life website, catholicruralife.org. Uh, there's extensive information there about the organization. They can join as members and I would very much encourage anyone, whether you live in a rural area or not, if you see the importance of maintaining healthy rural communities as society's link to God's original temple, we need your membership and I, I would personally invite you to, to join us in this mission of revitalizing rural America. Uh, a membership is very simple. You can join on the website. We suggest a $50 annual donation. Uh, we have a $25 digital student membership 
uh, where you receive our quarterly publication digitally instead of in the mail. But uh, with, with membership uh, comes the quarterly publication, which features a, a variety of articles on, on topics of interest, uh, on, on topics that pertain to rural culture from a Catholic perspective. Great. Well, thank you very much for sitting down with me, and I really appreciate your time. Thank you, Matt.